everybody for coming out today. Valentine's Day weekend. Um, I'm Don Massett, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, cranial sacral program that we have here, and then I'm going to talk about some of the power of emotions. And, um, with the cranial sacral program we have here, um, it's uh, Jackie talked about a little bit about shamanism, and um, our cranial program is a shamanic approach to cranial sacral therapy. So when I talk about a shamanic approach, I'm talking a lot about um, taking the limits off of healing. Um, in our model here, we uh, see a lot of, our medical model plays a lot in the physical realm, and it's kind of limited to the physical realm. And um, so to have a shamanic approach, there's two things that I'm looking for. And one thing in our program is to take the limits off of healing and come out of the just the physical part. And the other part is to evolve ourselves as human beings. We always think of the shaman as this gifted healer, and they are, but they, we all have that inside of us. And for all of us to go inside and tap into that powerful um, healing abilities that we all have. So um, with cranial sacral therapy, there's a little history to it, and the history will give us a little understanding of where we're going with it. Um, I take it into what we call sacred journey therapy, and I'll kind of give you an idea of where it started. And it started really with osteopathy. And it was in the early 1900s, just before the early 1900s, there was a guy by the name of Andrew Still. And Andrew Still was a soldier, and um, one day he laid, had a migraine headache, and he laid down on, uh, on the ground next to a tree. And you know how you have sometimes these veins that come out of the ground, and he had his head you know, propped on one of the veins, and all of a sudden, this migraine headache went away like that. And he was really intrigued by that. Now, I always like to, I'm not a big history buff, but I like to get these little stories of how people started. And Andrew Still actually became a doctor of osteopathy, and he was the founder of osteopathy, and he started it when he was 60 years old which was pretty incredible because this was back around 1890. And so uh, that was one of his first experiences, and he was intrigued by that, and he began, he was the, now the father of osteopathy. One of his students, William Sutherland, um, he was intrigued by the skull and the cranial bones. And what he did was he took a skull and he disarticulated the bones. And so we know as we grew up with kids in science books that um, when a baby's born, the skull starts to fuse and there's no movement. And actually, even though that's still in the science books, there is movement. And William Sutherland proved it and he started to experiment with the bones because when he disarticulated the bones, he could see that the sutures of the bones were beveled and they were designed for movement. And so what he did was he decided that he was going to do some experiments on himself. And he's an osteopath, uh, one of Andrew Still's students, and he had an office, and they're doing osteopathic manipulations, which is kind of like <coughs> chiropractic five or ten minute manipulations. Um, but what he found out was that what he was going to experiment with was that if you could move a cranial bone, what would happen if you moved a cranial bone? So he started to take, he took an old football helmet. In those days, they were made of leather. And so he took some of the leather straps and a football, old football helmet, and he'd strap it on his head in his office where nobody could see him. And he'd strap this thing on, and he was trying to, like, move a cranial bone. And it sounds pretty crazy, but while he was doing it, after maybe 10 or 15 minutes, all of a sudden, he would feel something going on in his body, like he would develop sinusitis. Or maybe he would develop vertigo. He'd start to get dizzy from moving a cranial bone. And so then, uh, next day or a couple of days later, he would strap the straps on a different way. Maybe 
around the mandible and strap it around the uh, temporal bones. And all of a sudden, he started to experience what we would call TMJ syndrome, a pain here uh, from strapping these straps and restricting certain cranial bones or moving certain cranial bones. And he was starting to produce these symptoms in his body and he was really intrigued by this. And this went on for months, these experiments. Nobody would see him. Um, one day, uh, he was in his office experimenting on himself and he had these straps on and this football coming on and he had these other things tied up and all of a sudden his wife walked into the office and she saw what was going on so he was like kind of busted for whatever he was doing he's explaining what he's doing, these experiments, you know, and she says, you're causing yourself headaches, you're causing yourself migraines, you're causing yourself, and he would even get sciatic problems and back aches from moving a cranial bone. So what he started to tell his wife, he says, listen, he says, and he was excited, he says, I'm creating these symptoms, and I know that if I can create a symptom in my body from moving a cranial bone, I know that I can relieve a symptom in my body from uh, moving a cranial bone. So he started, he was the first, to develop what we would call cranial osteopathy. So he worked a lot with the cranial bones. Uh, his wife, it was interesting because when she was listening to him explain his story, she started to talk about, you know, in the last few months, while you're doing these experiments, I have been noticing some emotional and attitudinal changes in you, such as maybe depression hyperactivity, or excitement, or different things that were unusual behavior patterns while he was going through these experiments, which Sutherland didn't quite understand and didn't really come out till later with this work. But anyway, as Alpledger, as uh, Sutherland was doing this work with the cranial osteopathy, one of his students came around, and his name was John Upledger, and some massage therapists are familiar with John Upledger. He does a lot of work in massage schools, some of the massage therapists, uh, he's got a big school. Um, but what Upledger was doing was he decided to take the work of osteopathy, or cranial osteopathy, he learned from Sutherland, and he started to put this out to the public. Um, he knew that if you had somebody on the table for like an hour and 15 minutes, how profound those sessions would be instead of like a five minute manipulation that was taking place. So what Upledger was doing was he was working with people in a more altered state. We call it an alpha or a theta state which is a, a healing state. Ryan, you good there? You want to come over here? Anyway? I'm good. Okay. So, so Upledger knew there was a power to work on somebody for like an hour, hour, 15 minutes and bring them in that state. And actually that state is like a healing state. When you go into an alpha state, it's like your soul and your body starts to um, go into a pattern where it starts to heal itself. And one way that it starts to heal itself is to start to bring up emotions that we don't want in our body, which could be anger or worry or insecurity. Um, what we're going to find out is that emotions is a lot the uh, cause of physical and uh, mental health problems. So anyway, those things started to come up on the table, and John Upledger was really intrigued by this, but he didn't know how to put the work out there because he knew a doctor was not going to work on somebody for an hour and 15 minutes. So he decided to put this work out to, let's say, a massage therapist would do it. Um, I think maybe a nurse would do it. Um, there's certain people that he figured that would put that time in and when you put that time in the work is so much more profound so John Upledger also was quite the rebel because he was kind of battling with the medical model and so he wanted to structure it so that it would be accepted by the medical model so he had very strict protocols and it was in a very controlled environment 
Um, <coughs> but he brought it out there. Although the medical model was, how dare you bring something so profound as osteopathy and develop this and bring this out to the public so that the public could practice this. Um, but uh, very powerful. And after, uh, but the work was still being worked in what we would call a physical level using techniques, almost like Sutherland, moving a cranial bone to get a, a symptom or relieve a symptom. Uh, so another guy came along, and it was actually a student of John F. Bledger, and actually I studied under John F. Bledger, and that was um, Hugh Milne. Hugh Milne was a Scottish osteopath, and he went down to, um, where was it? South America? India. India? He went to India for six years, left his practice, went to India to study meditation. And you think, what is going on there with Hugh Mill? Well, what he did was, there was a very powerful thing that he brought into the work, and one was he knew there was an emotional core to all physical problems. He knew that. And to get to it, you really needed to go into these altered trance states with the work. Another thing that he knew is that for to work with somebody, you had to hold an incredible trusting space for that person to go to these levels, and that you really, we have to do our own inner work to provide a space um, for people to go to these depths. And that's where the meditation came in and the self-inner work came in with Hugh Milne. Uh, it was the therapists doing their own work to raise their vibration so that they could work on these levels with the uh, patients. Um, so Hugh Milne was really powerful what he brought to the work. Um, one time when I was working with somebody with uh, TMJ, and I used to have these TMJ clients come, and it would be this jaw pain that they would get. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would do some techniques with that. <clears throat> Help Ledger taught us these osteopathic techniques where you actually go into the mouth and you soften the lateral pterygoid muscle, and all of a sudden that relieves the jaw, and you think like, oh, what I just did, you know. And then the person leaves. But what happened was, with me, it was like, um, I want to say maybe 30 or 4 percent of them were fine afterwards, but then some were coming back. You know, like all of a sudden, a week or two later, they're coming back and we're doing this procedure over again. And it's given them a real uh, immediate relief, but I'm not getting that long term thing. So I talked to Hugh about that. And he told me, he says, Don, I'll tell you something about Tim J syndrome. There's two things. One, there's a physical thing that are going on, which you're working with, with the lateral pterygoid muscles. But, he says, with every physical problem, there is an emotional thing going on with it. And that's the core to the problem. So when you're talking about TMJ syndrome, you're working with somebody that's not expressing what they truly feel. And so think about that. Say if you're on a job and you've been working somewhere for 20 years and you can't stand your job but you can't say anything because, you know, you don't want to get fired and you start to feel this in here and you start to suppress this every day. When you hold those emotions every day like that, boom, they start to manifest into the physical, into the temporal mandibular joint and there's the core of the problem is the emotional part or somebody that's in a relationship doesn't want to rock the relationship or say anything, so they keep it to themselves and they're grinding their teeth. How many people have ever ground their teeth at night sleeping? <laughs> oh, we got a whole bunch of hands coming up. Well, what that is, is that the emotions are coming up when you're sleeping, they're in your subconscious. And so what happens is you're suppressing these emotions and when you start to go in subconscious, first you go into that alpha beta state and your body or your soul starts to push those emotions out. It's part of your self-healing process and what it does is it comes up here and you start grinding your teeth. It's 
like you're so aggravated and you start grinding your teeth. Well, if you go to a dentist, they don't have the knowledge or the palpation skills, so what they're doing is giving you a mouth guard. Some people grind through the mouth guards, you know. But what they're doing is they're just trying to protect the teeth. We want to go to the core of the problem. And Hugh told me that when you start to talk to these people, they need to be able to express what they're truly feeling. And when you get that and start that with people, uh, you really get to the core of that. Well, actually, all disorders, and we're just showing you a few of them up here, all disorders have an emotional core to them. Asthma, big emotional core to asthma. Uh, fibromyalgia is an emotional core. It goes into your nervous system. Doctors, for years, they couldn't understand what was going on because they couldn't find anything physical with fibromyalgia, but the symptoms were real. And so what they would do is they'd send them to a psychiatrist. But what it really is, is it has to do with an emotional core. All, all these disorders have an emotional core, and Hugh Milne really struck that. Now with Hugh, I taught for Hugh for years, and we started to, I like to constantly evolve um, the cranial sacral and what I've done is I've taken it into what we call sacred journey therapy or shamanic approach to cranial sacral therapy and what we need to go is from the physical we teach the physical and we go into the emotional which is so powerful it's the core and now as we're working with these we need to go into the spiritual part of the work and the spiritual part of the work is the belief systems and the concepts of the work. Uh, for instance, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia doesn't exist in the physical. That's why they can't cure schizophrenia. And the way to come in here to be on Wellness today or Sacred Journey Institute, I was driving down 183rd Street and I'm turning on Harlem and here is the Tinley Park Mental Hospital it was shut down four years ago, and the big thing that they dealt with at, mental, at the Tilly Mental Hospital was schizophrenia and uh, depression, people that were suicidal, and they couldn't help anybody. And so they stopped funding it. And what happens is they're working completely in the physical, and it's not working. And so this hospital had thousands of patients, there for life on medications, um, wasn't working, and they finally shut it down. There's so much money being fed into that. And you start thinking, the first thing I thought was, you know, what a shame, and where did all these patients go to? And so you're thinking, this is a tragedy. But actually, it's a gift, because when something isn't working, something else comes up that is working. And so we're doing some things here with what we have to do to work with schizophrenia is actually we have to look at it differently. We have to look at it differently. And with schizophrenia, uh, some of the symptoms of schizophrenia are actually symptoms of the evolved human. Hearing voices. How many times we talk about the shamans that are connecting with spirit. Well, schizophrenics are doing that. Delusions or thoughts or things like that that are showing up with the schizophrenics are actually opening to portholes of communication with another realm. And if we start to look at these things differently, actually we can take that person and look at that person as extremely gifted and start to bring the gifts out in this person. And not only are we doing it with schizophrenia, but we're doing it with the children with autism. We're doing it with the children with ADHD. Instead of labeling a disorder and bringing out uh, Ritalin or Adderall to solve the problem and suppress uh, feelings, let's look at the feelings of these kids that are coming into the world today. They're extremely empathic and this is their gifts. This is their gifts. And so to look at them as gifted and work with their gifts 
and work with how they can, we can release their uh, emotions. A lot of children like this that are coming in the world, um, we're not seeing them for who they really are. And their emotions are so powerful. And so we can utilize that and um, bring them to a place where they can go into their evolved capabilities instead of suppressing the emotions. When we give a child Ritalin or Adderall, we think that we're controlling them and we think that they're taking away their anxiety, but you know, we're, it's not um, particular what emotions you're suppressing. You're also suppressing their passion, their excitement, their love, their drive. You're suppressing all of the emotions. And these are the gifts of these children. There's a lot of special children coming into this world and the school are they're full of them. And so now there's also something going on where another system is not working. And we have to change the system. The children are making us look at the system in a different way because it's not fitting them. Just like Tinley Park doesn't fit the schizophrenic patients anymore. So we have to do something else. So what we're doing here really is we're um, opening up belief systems and looking at these people in a different manner, whether, whether it's a children or whether it's a schizophrenic or whether it's somebody that's bipolar. Phobias. Where do phobias come from? Could it come from another lifetime? Doesn't fit the belief systems over here. So what we have to do is we have to look at opening our belief systems Look at um, taking the limits off of healing. Now let's go into um, the power of emotions. You want to come up? This is my wife, Anya. <laughs> so I'm going to start with emotions. When we talk about emotions, it's the core to physical problems. It's the core to mental health problems. Um, when we talk about emotions, we're going to go to this first part of the chart here. And we're going to talk about how the heart feels. And feelings, um, feelings is the core. If we're over here, and, and all of us bounce to both sides of this. Over here we have feelings, uh, resentment, anger, grief, manipulation, victim energy, insecure, sacrifice, expectations, jealousy. Over here we've got compassion, appreciation, unconditional love, gratitude. We've got all the pretty words over here. We know all the pretty words over here. And so let's take a word, jealousy. Is a feeling. Has anybody in the room ever felt the feeling of jealousy? Okay, we got some hands up, we got some in the pockets. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the feeling of jealousy, where does that come from? And usually when we have a feeling of jealousy, the first thing we do is we project it. Like, ooh, that person is causing me jealousy, or that person is giving me jealousy, or this is the reason I'm jealous is over here. Well, actually, nobody can hand you a feeling. Feelings come from within. They get triggered, but they always come from within. Now, if we go inside to see where jealousy comes from, if we go inside and take a trip, because all of our emotions, only 5% of our emotions are on the surface in our conscious. But that's great because it gives us an awareness that it's there. 95% is in our subconscious. So when we talk about cranial sacral therapy, we're talking about an incredible modality here that works into the subconscious works with these emotions. Now if we go inside with insecurity, where it takes us, if we follow it, it goes to insecurity. Jealousy goes to the emotion of insecurity. 
that emotion, you know, us guys, we keep that very deep in our pockets. <laughs> we don't let anybody see, you know, insecurity. So there's the emotion we got to tap into. If we were very secure in ourselves, totally secure, we actually would never feel the feeling of jealousy. So the work, the inner work, is really going inside with the emotions. Now, when we go inside with the emotions, here's how powerful our emotions are. Our emotions will actually cloud the way we see the world. It clouds our perception. And it's not just like the way we see the whole world, but it'll cloud our perception in an argument with our spouse. If we're angry, we are not seeing clearly what we are arguing about because we have fear or anger behind our perception, and it will always cloud the perception. Um, not only does it change our perception, controls the way we see, but the, our emotions will go right into what we're creating. Separation, emptiness, pain, instability. It's actually our emotions that will create disease or health over here. Also with emotions comes other things. Um, our emotions, what we're feeling, if we're feeling, say, Let's pick one up here. If we're feeling resentment. If we're feeling resentment, not only will resentment affect our physical, it's one of the causes of cancer, not only will it affect our physical, but we take resentment and we bring it into our field. And our field is actually outside of our body. And so when we take resentment out here, what we'll do is we'll draw experiences to ourselves to support resentment. And so look how responsible we are now for our emotions. When we put anger out there, we actually will draw to ourselves in our field experiences to support the very emotion that we're feeling. And that's why this is a core. If we take appreciation, and in the moment we're appreciating something, we actually bring that in our field, and we will draw appreciation. Experiences to support appreciation. So the inner work goes to the emotions. Now there's other work. It has to be done also, which you can do with cranial sacral, but there's a great modality called NLP, and Anya practices NLP, and it helps with, uh, I'll let Anya talk about it, but it helps with some of the patterns. We create patterns in our life in childhood, uh, and they can be archetypal roles, they can be patterns of behavior, and there's a ways to go right into those patterns. I'll let Anya talk about it. I'll get out of your way. Uh, no, you're fine. You can